Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to <coughs> Christian Ramers to introduce our guest. Great. Thanks, Kent. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jared Baden, one of our faculty members, as an associate professor in infectious diseases, global health, and epidemiology, and truly one of the leaders in HIV prevention research. Uh, he did a great uh, session at CROI, both presenting his own research and then as well as doing a symposium on this very important topic, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention. So, Jared, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. And so I'm going to talk about PrEP for HIV prevention. My disclosures are that I have research funding but no financial interest and have not received any money from any pharmaceutical company to talk about PrEP or to do research on PrEP. I lay out learning objectives, um, which are a requirement of the talk. We're going to talk about the concept of PrEP, to talk about the data from the two pivotal studies that have been presented recently to the US FDA for a proposed label indication for pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention, and then talk about um, the importance of regular testing and periodic renal safety monitoring in persons who would be taking PrEP, thinking forward to actual prescribing. So the concept of PrEP is one in which HIV uninfected persons would use a medicine to keep themselves HIV free. By taking a medicine ahead of an exposure, having the medicine in the blood or, in the t or ideally in the relevant tissues, PrEP may make it so that the virus is unable to establish infection. The analogy I make most commonly is that, to, is that of malaria prophylaxis. For individuals traveling to endemic areas for malaria, prophylaxis doesn't prevent um, the mosquito bite that might happen, but would prevent the parasite from taking, take, taking hold. This might graphically lay it out a little bit um, clearly and help distinguish the difference between pre- versus post-exposure prophylaxis. For an individual who has an HIV exposure, there is a chance that HIV infection will develop. Post-exposure prophylaxis, which many of us have, um, and many of you probably have, prescribed for occupational or non-occupational exposures, may diminish the chances that HIV infection will become established. The scientific evidence for post-exposure prophylaxis is relatively limited based on um, retrospective data and animal model um, studies, and probably no definitive study of post-exposure prophylaxis will ever be done. Nonetheless, it is commonly used and has quite a bit of expert opinion and guidance to suggest how to use it best. Pre-exposure prophylaxis would extend the use of an antiretroviral to at least some period before HIV exposure happened. And from animal model studies, we can have, we have some sense, probably actually quite a good sense, that pre-exposure prophylaxis, that is having the medication on board prior to the exposure, would provide greater HIV protection than a dose um, initiated after exposure happens. In addition, of course, one of the greatest challenges to post-exposure prophylaxis is initiation of the therapy at all, because many um, HIV exposures are unrecognized or unacknowledged, and are unrecognized or acknowledged even when post-exposure prophylaxis is subsequently initiated because post-exposure prophylaxis has its best efficacy if done within 12 hours of an exposure. For individuals with ongoing HIV exposures, such as the, this example here, a single episode of post-exposure prophylaxis may provide some degree of protection from a single exposure, but not from the repeated exposures while pre-exposure prophylaxis for individuals with ongoing and repeated exposures may, may um, allow ongoing protection. Of course, it's important to recognize that HIV exposures may not be ongoing or frequent or may not be life, may not extend for, for extended periods of time. And pre-exposure prophylaxis is probably best designed as something that is time-limited and regular, re regularly reassessed because I think everyone goes through um, periods of greater or lesser risk of HIV um, during their lifetime. So among the medications currently available, PrEP has been tested um, most extensively based on tenofovir-based medications, either um, tenofovir alone, which is branded in the United States as Viriad, or co-formulated on tricytabine tenofovir, which is sold under brand, as branded Truvada in the United States. These have been chosen for pro pre-exposure prophylaxis studies because they are potent, they have a tremendous safety database uh, um, from the, their use for HIV-positive persons, for which tenofovir-based medications are the most commonly prescribed medications for treatment of HIV in the United States at this time. And as medications go, they're relatively easy to use. Two studies were presented recently to the US FDA as pivotal studies for a potential label indication for pre-exposure prophylaxis. The first was the IPREC study. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial among nearly 2,500 men who have sex with men from um, a global population. 
um, uh, South America, uh, South Africa, Thailand, and um, two sites in the United States, Boston and San Francisco. Men had behavioral characteristics putting them at high risk of HIV, less than half, more, a half were under 25 years old. The median number of partners in the three weeks prior to enrollment was 18, although there was quite a variation in that. And 60% reported unprotective receptive anal sex in the prior three months. So obviously recruiting um, and prescribing PrEP to individuals who carry a behavioral risk would be important. And these are what was recruited for the IPREC study. The IPREC study out of 2,500 men experienced, um, 100 of them experienced HIV zero conversion during the course of follow-up. 36 who had been randomized to m to nofavir, or branded Truvada, and 64 had been randomized to placebo, translating to an efficacy estimate of 44% um, reduction in HIV risk. This is um, the 44% reduction in HIV risk was in the intent to treat analysis, but I'll be talking in a minute about d additional analyses that suggest higher efficacy in those who continue to use the medication. The second pivotal study is the study um, uh, which, uh, which I ran, uh, part of the Partners PrEP study, was in recruited HIV serodiscordant couples, that is, in which one member was HIV infected and the other was uninfected. All were heterosexual and all resided in Kenya and Uganda, where the study, where the study was conducted. HIV positive partners were not taking antiretroviral therapy at the time of the study, at their time they were enrolled into the study, although 20% of them subsequently initiated during study follow up. Negative partners were randomized to tenofovir alone, combination of tricetamine, tenofovir, or matching placebo, and were followed for up to three years. In the partners PrEP study, PrEP also demonstrated significant efficacy for HIV prevention. There were 52 infections in the placebo arm compared to 17 infections in the tenofovir alone arm and 13 infections in the combination arm, translating to 67% and 75% protection against HIV for those who are receiving active PrEP. The difference between tenofovir alone and intracytabine tenofovir, that is 67 versus 75, is not statistically different, and we consider them comparable at this time. Based on these results, the Partners PrEP study actually had an interim and out, was, was, had its placebo arm stopped earlier than anticipated by its, by its independent data and safety monitoring board because, it, because of the, the dramatic, dramatic degree of HIV protection in the two active PrEP arms. This is what I mentioned earlier um, with trying to ascertain whether individuals were taking PrEP and the degree of HIV protection when PrEP was present. The column in the center um, details the percentage who had tenofovir detected in their blood of individuals who didn't become HIV infected. This is among a random sample from both the IPREX and the Partners PrEP studies. 51% of men in the IPREX study had tenofovir detected, or in other words, 49% of the men appeared not to be consistently using the PrEP medication. In Partners PrEP, where HIV, where HIV negative persons all had an HIV positive partner, 81% were taking the medication. When this is all back Calculated out, the degree of HIV protection associated with use of tenofovir appears to be quite high, 92% in the IPREC study and 90% in partners PrEP. So in other words, when PrEP is present, degree of HIV protection was approximately 90%. There are a number of secondary questions that were asked, that have been asked in the, in the pivotal PrEP trials, and I display just a couple of them here. I'm happy to answer questions on many more of them. In the interest of time, I limited to just these points. In the pivotal PrEP trials, PrEP appeared to be very safe, and we have a great degree of experience with the use of tenofovir in combination of m tricetamine tenofovir for PrEP. Nausea and gastrointestinal side effects were present in the minority, less than 10% in both studies, were mild, and were primarily during the first month of study follow-up. Renal safety was monitored closely in both trials, there appeared to be no significant increase in renal side effects, both glomerular and tubular, um, but tenofovir certainly requires ongoing monitoring of normal renal function and initiation in persons with normal renal function. Antiretroviral resistance is an important question. Of course, the use of PrEP medications in persons who remain HIV-free has no risk of resistance. In the absence of infection, people have no chance of developing resistance. In persons who become infected, resistance is a question. In the PrEP trials, none of the individuals who became infected after enrollment had resistance present, likely because they weren't taking PrEP. So in the absence of PrEP taking, infection may have happened, but resistance risk was low. There were some cases of resistance seen in the PrEP trials in individuals who had seronegative acute infection at the time they initiated PrEP, the time they enrolled into the study. This was a minority of individuals, small number, but two cases of M184B resistance in the 
in the IPREX study, one case of Y94V and one case of K65R in the Partners PrEP study were observed. This emphasizes the importance of HIV testing prior to initiation of PrEP for ascertainment as best one can of acute infection um, through symptom ascertainment if that is possible, and ongoing testing early after PrEP is initiated, since initiating PrEP may not, in all cases, develop resistance over in short course, but resistance may develop with longer duration of, of unopposed therapy. In Partners PrEP, we had six additional individuals who had acute infection who were randomized to the active um, arms who did not develop resistance, for example. Thus, in summary, in two pivotal studies, PrEP using combination m tricitabine tenofovir provided definitive protection against HIV acquisition among high-risk populations, men who have sex with men and um, individuals who were at risk of HIV infection because they had a known seropositive partner. This degree of protection was provided in the context of other prevention services, counseling, condoms, and ongoing HIV testing. Side effects were mild, antiretroviral resistance was rare, but both are important considerations. And what I did not present is that there was no evidence of greater risk-taking, behavior risk-taking while on PrEP. Indeed, risk-taking risk actually went down and went down considerably in both studies. The U.S. FDA is currently reviewing a label indication for Truvada for HIV prevention. This would be a first. There is no medication currently licensed for HIV prevention for uh, HIV prevention for sexual transmission, um, and this opens up an entirely new avenue of thinking of new ways to prevent HIV. An advisory committee to the FDA recommended on the 10th of May that a label indication be added for prevention of sexual transmission, and there were, there were separate considerations made for men who have sex with men, for heterosexual serodiscordant couples, and for other persons at, at higher risk of HIV, and all um, there was a majority vote for uh, label indication to be added. If approved an FDA and an FDA decision is required, actually, by June under law, the first, uh, this would be the first medication approved for prevention of HIV. CDC in 2011 issued interim guidance on, the, on prescribing for pre-exposure prophylaxis for prevention of HIV infection directed at men who have sex with men. Um, subsequent guidance and guidelines um, are expected to be issued should FDA um, approve a label indication. CDC is waiting for FDA's, um, as its sister U.S. government agency, to um, make its own decision. But these guidelines are worth reading. The important things to emphasize is that HIV testing, both at baseline and ongoing, is necessary, and some degree of monitoring of renal function um, in, a, in much the same way as we monitor renal function when we prescribe tenofovir for, or tenofovir-containing compounds for HIV um, treatment. PrEP is part of a combination prevention strategy, and I want to emphasize that there is, this is not a magic situation. This uh, magic bullet for HIV prevention, what must be emphasized is how, if prescribed, PrEP would work in combination with testing, risk reduction, and other things that we do both with individual patients and on a public health level to reverse the epidemic. And these are final questions. Thank you.